Saeed Jalili, Iran's chief nuclear negotiator, says Tehran will present new initiatives at this weekend's talks with the five plus one countries. They're, of course, Security Council members plus Germany. The event has been mediated, at least in some circles, as a last-ditch effort to halt Iran's march towards a nuclear weapon. Some strategists believe failure will lead to Israel mounting a strike against an Iranian underground facility near the holy city of Gom. Welcome to Agenda with George Friedman, who has a different perspective on Iran's goals. George, let's start with the talks. What new proposals could Iran come up with that the 5 plus 1 would find interesting? Well, I think the question really is what proposals could the 5 come up with that Iran finds interesting? Um, it's the West that wants Iran to do something. Iran doesn't want to do it. I think the Iranians look at this as an opportunity to buy time and to focus really in on the nuclear issue. As I've written about in the past, I don't think the nuclear issue is the fundamental issue from the Iranian point of view, and except for Israel from most of the other countries. The real issue is the growing sphere of influence of Iran uh, in the Middle East, including Iraq, potentially um, Syria, Hezbollah, is becoming a powerful power. I think that the Iranians use their nuclear program as the matador uses the cape to hide the sword. The sword is their growing influence through Shiites and other people throughout the region. Uh, the cape is the nuclear weapon issue that everybody is charging at. So I have a somewhat different view than most people do. And I think the Iranians are sophisticated enough uh, to do this. It's interesting sometimes. Uh, people say the Iranians aren't smart enough to do this or sophisticated enough to have that strategy. They are, however, sophisticated enough to build a nuclear weapon, but nothing else are, they're capable of. I think they're far more capable of having a subtle foreign policy than they are of building nuclear weapons. There is, though, some evidence that the UN sanctions are starting to handicap Iran, and presumably the Iranians might use these talks to try and have them modified. Well, in my view, these sanctions are not having very much effect, although they're having some, undoubtedly. Uh, the West has been particularly eager to trumpet how painful this is, but that's primarily because the United States in particular is eager to show that there is no need for any military action at this time, because sanctions are working. Uh, if the Iranians were really being hurt by these sanctions, they might change their policy. They're not changing their policy uh, because they're managing the pain substantially. For example, uh, Iranian companies are not allowed to do business overseas, but they've created tons of companies, front companies that are Iranian controlled but don't trace back to Iran, that are capable of doing this. They have had long experience in uh, avoiding sanctions, of creating systems to avoid the pressure. Plus, uh, there are many countries that are putatively part of the sanction program that really aren't very acting very effectively, aren't interested in doing it, and some that have been explicitly excluded from some of the, um, some of the harsher elements, such as the Japanese who need their oil. So on the whole, I regard the claims of the effect on the Iranians something that, one, the West would like to have, and the Iranians are quite happy to have the West believe they're having this effect, because then that also relieves the threat of a military strike. It's reported they're also offering easy credits to a number of countries that buy their oil. It amounts to a generous discount. Well, there are two things they're doing, and one is the official, and the other is front companies buying oil and delivering it in various ways. I mean, if a ship is sailing into a Iranian harbor flying a ch Chinese flag, the United States is not about to torpedo it, is not about to board it. Uh, so the traffic is going on, uh, and everybody knows that it is, and everybody's hoping that there's going to be some marginal effort. But truly, the one thing that the Iranians and the Americans agree on is the need to portray these sanctions as effective. I, I don't think they're that effective. They may have some. So, to come back to your thesis here, that Iran's real goal is becoming the regional hegemon, to what extent is that ambition handicapped by conflicts, such as the one in Syria next door? 
Well, they're not handicapped by the Syrian conflict. They benefit from it. Note that the Assad regime has not fallen. In spite of a year of uh, conflict, uh, the Assad regime remains intact. That's an empirical fact. You can oppose it or support it, but that's the way it is. Uh, supporting the, Irani uh, the Syrians are the Iranians, who provided apparently weapons, who provided, by some accounts, uh, advisors. If Assad should manage to survive, uh, where he was previously an equal partner uh, following his own foreign policy, he now becomes very much a client of Iran. And that increases their power. So the Iranians benefit from that conflict as they benefit from many of the conflicts. So long as they don't have internally the kind of conflicts that other countries are having, um, they're in a pretty good position. So what should we be looking for next in terms of Iran gaining more power? A great deal of it has already happened. Uh, first, to have a tremendous amount of influence in a very weak and divided Iraq is one element. Second, and I don't know that the Assad regime will survive, but it's showing every sign of survival, uh, that will be an asset to the Iranians. They already have Hezbollah, a pro-Iranian group with a tremendous amount of power in Lebanon, a tremendous amount of influence. Uh, the United States is withdrawing from Afghanistan, and Iran has a lot of influence in Western Afghanistan, in the Shiite regions and other regions. So wh when you look at the table, you're seeing that they're well underway to increasing their power. The next phase is using it. Once the Syrian situation settles down, and if the Syrian situation settles down in Assad's favor, both have to be seen yet, uh, the Iranians are going to be the dominant power along the northern frontier of Saudi Arabia. And they will also have influence with Shiites in the eastern province, as well as Shiites uh, in Bahrain and other areas in the region. Uh, they will be in position to bring a great deal of pressure on the Saudis, not threatening the regime perhaps, but certainly making it extremely uncomfortable, and opening the door for some sort of accommodation by the Saudis to Iranian power if the United States doesn't act first either to constrain the Iranians, which I don't think they will, or doesn't make its own deal with Iran, which is possible. But we're really finishing the first phase of their expanded power. It's real, it's substantial. Uh, we now enter the second phase slowly as they begin to use that power. Is this evolution inevitable, unstoppable? It is not unstoppable. The one place to begin to stop it in, is in Syria, but nobody wants to get deeply bogged down in Syria. This is not a Libya. This is a serious matter. And the United States has no appetite for this, nor do the Europeans. Uh, so that would be one place where it could be stopped. Uh, it could obviously also be stopped if the Americans and Turks move vigorously against the Iranians. Uh, but the Turks are not interested in being a regional imperial power. They're not interested in getting involved. Uh, so the problem is, and this is the classic case, Certainly, it could be contained if countries were prepared to take the needed risk and countries were prepared to um, sacrifice a great deal of resources to do it. And the problem is that at the moment, except for Israel, at least talking about it, no one is prepared to take risks. And that's not likely to change whoever wins the United States election? Well, we saw with the election of Obama how little change from George Bush's foreign policy. We find that presidential candidates dream of all sorts of alternatives. We find that presidents uh, discover they have much fewer choices. I suspect, and at this point it seems to come down to Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, I don't expect to see a major change in foreign policy, although undoubtedly uh, you will see all sorts of claims by Mitt Romney as to what he would do differently. George, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Stratfor's founder, George Friedman, with that analysis on Iran's intentions. I'm Colin Chapman. Thanks for being with us today. Goodbye.